Hello and welcome into episode 284 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Bridget Prue here with Scott McLaughlin. Brian is working, um, which we forgive him. We, we forgive him. Uh, I, d- I don't. Speak for yourself. Okay, that's right. I, I forgot. No, no one has any allegiances on this podcast anymore. I think he should completely throw his real job out the window. And yeah, to focus, be completely honest, I focus on no- on you know care only about three hours of podcasting a week. So. To be completely honest, I have no idea what his real job is anymore. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to say he's uh, he's an electrician. He's he's designing the Ducks New Jerseys for, oh, the, that's for probably their upcoming why redesign. He, yeah. That's probably why he couldn't tell us what he was doing. No, I have no idea what he does. Um, anyway, Brian, next podcast, let us know. Um, <laughs> he used to work in the studio with me at WEI, but... You know, now he just sticks with the pod and does, I don't know, plumbing. I I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, we're coming to you after the Bruins lost in overtime to the Oilers um, in a game that, I don't know, Scott, would you say that was like a 58-minute effort that the Bruins won? And then the last two, um, it kind of slipped it slipped into a tie and then you feel like once it goes to three on three and you see dry settle and make David on the ice that you're like, this is not, <laughs> this isn't a good position to put yourself in. Um, and of course um, on their second shift out there, they score in overtime and, and it was a bad overtime again. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that. Um, I want to go to your opening shift first because we have some trade deadline rumors that are getting spicy. Um, and this is one that Scott is really excited about. I think that this is a big move. Like when we were talking about categorizing, are they going to stay pat? Or is the team worth investing in? Or is Don Sweeney more likely to make a big move? I would characterize this rumor as a big move. And it includes three teams. So yeah, it's, it's kind of elaborate and it's exciting. So Scott, why don't you get to your opening shift? Yeah, it's it's ex- it's exciting because it's a big name and it's one that we've heard before, and that's Elias Lindholm, who is potentially back on the market. Um, Chris Johnston of uh, the Athletic TSN, multiple places, reported Tuesday late afternoon that uh, the Canucks are now pursuing Jake Gensel, who reportedly is expected to be traded by the Penguins uh, and it will certainly be the biggest name out there if he is moved. I, I hesitate to pick this as an opening shift because this all could happen on Wednesday. And with our luck, it will happen 10 minutes after we finish recording. Um, I'm leaving but, my, like I'm like leaving Twitter open and just like <laughs> refreshing it constantly during this. Yeah. Podcast. So, uh, but if you're wondering, how did the Canucks possibly go after Jake Gensel? They already made their big trade for Elias Lindholm. Well, it's because they could then flip Elias Lindholm to the Bruins, which is the the specific team that Chris Johnson mentioned. And, um, you know, I, I'll say like, I, I'm not excited in the sense that I'm like a huge fan of Elias Lindholm and think he, think he is an amazing player. I think he has some flaws, but he could certainly help this Bruins team. And I would be very curious what the cost to acquire him would be because he hasn't, it hasn't been a seamless transition to Vancouver. They've tried him in a few, they started with him on the wing, which is not his natural position. They've had him at third line center and his best seasons or specifically his best season uh, a couple years ago was when he had Johnny Gaudreau and Matthew Kachuk as his wings and, you know, he he elevates his game when he's with better players. Like, I, I, would I love don't know him next to pasta. I would love exactly. to see like a Zaka, Lindholm, pasta line. That would be that is a line that is much improved to what their first or second line. Like, or I could say call it a second line. Right. Um, if you're calling the Marshawn Coil line, like with the rest of the first line, like that's a great second line with. Zaka. Yeah, I, I would I would call that their first line if, if technically yeah it yeah. would be I but um, like we mentioned before like you can label either of those whatever you want it's it's you know it's it's your your other like one two punch uh, of a line 
Yeah, so we'll we'll get into this possibility more. Um, the Canucks gave up a lot to get Lindholm. Like I said, I I can't imagine the Bruins would have to give up as much. I feel like the no price has has decreased, and if, if Vancouver is desperate enough for Gensel that you know they're ready to move on after just a month, I wouldn't think that you're paying that pe- that premium price. Although. It will still be pricey for sure. Like you're, you're still gonna have to give up. I would say, at least two valuable assets. Yeah, my, this this to me reads like they they got like this toy, but then there was this other bigger toy that they were like, oh my god, we didn't know it was for sale, and then they now they're like, now they're gonna have to take a little bit of a loss on what for what they paid for him, um, if they are really desperate for specifically Jake Getzel. Um, and the only team that's interested in Elias Lindholm from them or the, and also think about it this way. It's really more about what the Penguins want from the Bruins. If it's a three team deal, it's like, okay, well, what do the Bruins have that the Penguins want to get via, you know, the triangle of this trade. So um, anyway, I don't want to get, I'm excited about this. I don't want to, I told Scott to keep it short and then I extended it. Um, anyway, mine which we'll start with, right? Because it's we're talking about the game, is the fact that the Bruins lost another game in overtime and they could not close it out. They had the goal came on under two minutes left to play. Goalie pulled. Heinen puts the puck off the side of the empty net. And it was like, it was that close. And they, then it would have been, you know, that's a Bruins win if that goes in. It's two nothing. Yeah. On, on a, um, a great back check by Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Yeah, it was. It, and it was impeded. And it's not like he just missed the net, right? Like he he got forced to not take the shot that was like going to be as successful. And and also, I think, got bumped at the same time. So um, yeah. it's not his Nugent fault. Nugent Hopkins got a stick on it. Like it was a yeah. block shot. It was, yeah, it was it, a really great play by Nugent Hopkins. It was. And, and so, like, you can't blame Hyden for not putting that in. But it's like, it just like kind of symbolizes the so close but still losing uh you're not getting the full two points and so uh they end up giving up the goal late puck bounces up in the air goes over Omar's head goes in the back of the net and it was a scramble and and I don't know Sky I don't think it's easy to blame Olmark for that one but you might have a different opinion it, there was just so much no, going on it's 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 a point blank deflection by Dry Seidel and he, he makes the initial save. It just it pops off his blocker and and goes up over him. Like you can't see it. it. Yeah, it, and I mean you talk about like a game of bounces. Like yeah, Nugent Hopkins just gets a stick on Heinen and, and prevents a closeout game a game clinching goal. Oilers get you know a pretty for, yeah a good play by McDavid and Drysital to connect there, but a fortunate bounce with it going up and over all mark. And then kind of another fortunate deflection in overtime. Brandon Carlo gets his stick on dry winning shot, but it deflects in past all mark instead of mm-hmm. wide. Like when Nugent Hopkins deflects Heinen shot it, you know, doesn't totally excuse it. Like there's still things the Bruins have to clean up. They once again, lost two defensive zone faceoffs leading up to both the tying and the winning goal that, continues to be an issue. Um, but now not to like sidetrack us yeah. back to your, sh- your opening take, but what's Elias Lindholm's face on numbers this year? <laughs> uh, really good. He's like 58%. <laughs> <What> I, <thought. laughs> uh, I looked up specifically defensive zone draws. He is 57.5%, which is there's 81 forwards in the NHL who have taken at least 200 defensive zone faceoffs. Uh, he is seventh best in winning percentage. Um, by the way, Charlie Coyle has taken the most defensive zone faceoffs in the NHL this season, and he's been solid. He's 52.5%, but that's obviously not dominant. And, and he did lose the key one leading up to the tying goal on Tuesday. Is that all situations, not just five on five stats? Oh, uh, yeah, all situations. Okay, that makes sense. He plays a lot of time in the D zone on starting PKs and stuff. Um, and he's good at it, then you should trust him in that situation because he's your best option, I should say. If you're the Bruins, he's your best option. It's pretty clear by the 
number of times you've used him in that situation. But... Yeah, uh, oddly enough, Pavel Zaka is actually better percentage wise, but they don't use him as much. And it is odd because it feels like Zaka's had more of these key losses late in the game. Yeah. But like, Zaka's... there's no stat. Like, what's the, can we get a stat for that? Yeah, it's, it's you can't really break it down by yeah. period, like unless like, I went the last box five scores, which, which I'm not gonna do. Um, yeah. but yeah, Zach is like 56% on defensive zone faceoffs, which I think would be very surprising to a lot of people just because the couple really bad losses that lead to tying or winning goals yeah. stand out. Yeah, and there's like you said, there's no way to filter by like importance of like last five minutes or. But that I'm sure internally things like that are tracked. Um, but and, at least they feel like they should be. Yeah. And one other thing I would just note to people, you're just by nature, you're going to lose more six on five face-offs than you win. Yeah, like because when, there's an extra guy that can jump right, in. Right. When, when you have the team that has more guys is always going to win more face-offs. It's the reason why, you know, the league average on power plays is like, 58% on faceoffs because it's five on four and you have more guys who can come in and help out. Like it. Yeah. So it also it does like it, it anecdotally looks worse, but it also just like statistically is going to be worse. Yeah. It's also why it's easier to force turnovers when you're on the power play. Cause you can send two guys to the boards to grab a puck rather than just one, because it, it's, it's a numbers game in, in terms of, of those, those kind of things. Um, when you have an extra guy, you can be more aggressive. So um, anyway, we got distracted again. This is going to keep happening. We're just going to end up keeping talking about Elias Lindholm until until inevitably we have to come film a supplemental podcast um, right before I drive to Connecticut. Um, right. I was going to say, until we just throw this entire episode out and do squeeze, squeeze in 12 minute reaction to Elias Lindholm trade. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be its own separate like breaking news podcast, guys, if you. Well, well, that's what we'll do. If I'm not in, if I'm not broadcasting, we'll make Brian do it. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what I was saying was uh, where I was at chronologically was Olmark lets the goal in. When we talked to him after the game, someone said, what did you see on that? And he goes, it, it popped up in the air. And that was the last I saw of the puck. Like I didn't, and it's, it was hard to blame him for that. Um, and so then they give up the goal to, in overtime to drive Seidel and Montgomery like he comes out for his normal press conference after the game. And he says he's, Oh no, no. <laughs> My alarm. Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> oh, I'm on the phone with Vancouver right now. Um, <laughs> hello. <laughs> well, what do you need for Elias went home? Um, but, uh, Brid Bridget working the phones leading up yes. the deadline. Mm -hmm. Um, actually Scott was in the booth or in the press box staring intently into the management booth <laughs> like he's like he's like he's poking me he's like sweeney's texting someone he's texting i was like i don't have binoculars scott i have no idea who he's texting but um you know he was sweeney watching yesterday i, I, I think it was papa Gina's. i think they were waiting for, <laughs> waiting for their second intermission pizza delivery yes, can can you deliver to the ninth floor things um well he got distracted again okay after the game Montgomery spoke to the media and he said that it was a bad overtime. It was a game they should have won. They didn't close it out in regulation. So they have to try to find a way to win in extra time. And it, it once again was like, I just want to call their overtime like chaos. Like the best word to describe Bruins overtime this season is just chaos. It's like it could be positive chaos for about 10 seconds. Then it's like right back to, oh, crap. Like what the hell is like someone's crashing into someone else. Stupid turnover back pass to no one. Um, Pasta had two turnovers in overtime that were both like, oh, God. Um, and I'll, I'll mark tying the puck up when he probably had a chance to move it and yep. that leads to the defensive zone face off, which I will question having Trent Frederick out there to take it. Cause he, again, it kind of comes down to like the lack of options. It's on, it's on the left side. So ideally you want a left shot taking it. Pavel Zaki had just been out for like over a minute, so he's not going to take it. So yeah. I guess like by default, Trent Frederick's your best option in that situation. But, um, he, he loses it. Oilers get possession. And then 
never give it back. Like 30 seconds later, they win yeah. the game. And we that's what we talk about. It's a game of possession. It's like I'm ta- when I'm taking my notes, I'm no like in my my overtime notes are a hundred percent just me being like, this is how they lo- like one team lost possession, the other. Because that's really the most important parts. It's like, okay, Pasternak has it, sends a drop pass to Zaka, who just collided with Grizzly, so no one was there to grab it. <laughs> or like, it just, you know, I, I'm paying attention to how the possession changes because a lot of times once you lose possession within 20 seconds, puck could be in the back of your own net. Like, it, it happens that quickly in overtime with three on three, especially against a team like Edmonton. And I think they would have had an uphill battle in the shootout too, honestly. But um, basically once you go to overtime or a shootout against Edmonton, you're, it's like you understand that your chances of winning were, were much better in regulation. <laughs> um, so anyway, it was Although concerning. Although facing, facing Stuart Skinner in a shootout, not all that scary. So Yeah, I guess I'm more talking about their, yeah. their sharp their sharp. Well, shooters. yeah, when, when they roll out – that that top three man unit that they have of McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Evan Bouchard, it's like it, borderline unguardable. Like what? Is, it's amazing that the Bruins survived one shift against them. I thought that too. The time. Yeah, there was a drop pass to McDavid like into the slot on that first shift, like from behind the goal line, right right into the slot. And I don't know how that. Day. I I think it was Carlo made like a nice play to break it up. I was like, that's going in, and then luckily never ended up in a shot. But. um yeah, so you don't want to put yourself in that situation, and and it makes you it makes you think like, all right, there's so many times, and not to bring up the playoffs last year again, but I'm gonna do it. Like there are so many times for them to close out that series, so many moments you can think back to, and then every time they have these moments in the regular season, you're like, okay, well that would have been another time that that bit them in the butt that they they didn't just close out the last two minutes of the game or, um. Like you let it get to overtime and then your your fate is like you had it controlled for 58 minutes and then then you don't anymore. And and, and in the playoffs, it's not a great um, method for success. Like you're not you're not winning playoff series like that. You can't just keep leaving it to chance. And it is concerning. And I think Montgomery would has admitted that like this is something that they need to work on before playoffs. Like this is something that. I don't know if he said concerning, but he definitely said like, um, is, is a, like a learning moment kind of thing. Yeah. So here's, here's a full quote. Um, you've got to find a way to close out a game. Just a great opportunity for us to realize that you can't take anything for granted because in a couple of months, it doesn't matter how tired you are at the end of a game. We've got to find a way to push through. We didn't find a way. Um, and, you know, for, for me, this is a game where I will separate how they played in the third period versus giving up the six on five goal. Because I thought their third period overall was really good. And when you add that on to how they closed out the Maple Leafs on Monday night, which this is our first podcast since then, um, way better, way, way better than some of their other blown leads where they fall apart in the third period and they're under siege and they can't get out of their own zone and they're running around and it, and it feels inevitable that there's another goal coming. Like this was different against Toronto. They actually had some sustained offensive zone time and they end up extending, extending the lead and pushing it to four one. That part was still kind of missing against Edmonton. I thought they did a really good job structurally in their own zone of they kept Edmonton to the outside. They only at five on five Edmonton only had one high danger chance in the third period, um, kept them away from the front of the net. I think they got clean clears. Um, they were able to get clean changes. Guys weren't getting stuck out there too long. They weren't icing the puck. So that was all encouraging. Um, Montgomery did say that he thinks that that is kind of where Tired legs showed up a little though. The second night of a back to back was they weren't able to get out in transition and they weren't able to kind of keep the pressure up in the offensive zone. They did all the defensive work, they got it out, but then they had to get off the ice and they weren't able to keep pushing forward. So I, you know, overall, just from the last two nights, like I've I've been Mr. Negative for a couple of weeks now. I'm encouraged by these last two games because 
I didn't know if the Bruins could still play defense like this. They hadn't for several weeks, but this was, they gave up, look, they gave up two regulation goals to two of the three best offenses in the N- in the NHL. Like that, that's a good sign. But obviously how it ends Tuesday leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. And you're getting some guys going that weren't going right. Like, DeBras scores against Toronto. Zaka scores twice against Toronto and once against Edmonton. Um, like you're you're getting some guys going that needed to get going. Um, scoring on the power play. Uh, you know, there were positives for sure. And and it's funny every time they beat Toronto. I don't know what it is about beating Toronto, but it always just kind of has that little like funny aspect to it because you know you just know what the reaction on Toronto to you knowing what the reaction is going to be in Toronto to the Bruins beating the Leafs is what makes it funny every time and on Canadian TV today I'm sure the entire morning has been spent being like you know never going to beat the Bruins like just freaking out like Razor was saying he's like on Sunday's game he's like they're the people in Toronto are afraid of Boston like people in Boston don't understand that other other franchises around the league are still worried to play Boston um, despite, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about with some bad losses and some not being able to close out games like other teams in the league still worry about playing the Bruins and you saw Toronto deal with that. Yeah, and, it, you know, they, they're they going to wrap up their regular season series against each other Thursday night at the Garden, but. And they yeah, could it, have like, imagine- different teams. They could have, com- like, this is what I was saying before, too. Like, this could be a different Bruins team than last time they were they were there. and. I mean, they, who knows? There could be no more DeBras. There could be no more Allmark. They could have Elias Lindholm. They could, who knows? Like, it could be a di- different matchup. Yeah, but, you know, just imagine if the Bruins complete the season sweep, like, be four wins in their four meetings. Um, you know, the first two of those did go to overtime in a shootout, and the Bruins won both. But, yeah, that's, that's your first-round matchup right now. And I think, you know, there definitely has to feel like that that Bruins boogeyman if you're Toronto and that's how it goes down. Um, but yeah, it, would you travel to Toronto for a playoff series? I'd be tempted yeah, to I don't know. get a get talk to a Odyssey on that. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll see how this road trip goes, right? And then we'll we'll see if we can do Toronto. <laughs> Yeah. Tra- you want to drive me? You want to drive me for eight and a half hours to Toronto? Is what I'm trying to say. I'm not driving to Toronto. So <laughs> you can you can do that if you like. I will uh, try to be getting on a plane. Oh come on! It's so much fun. Um, just I, I've done that before. I when I when I was younger, we did a family vacation to first we did Cooperstown in the Baseball Hall of Fame, then we did Niagara Falls, Toronto, including Hockey Hall of Fame, and then we did Ottawa too, which. I guess it was okay. In retrospect, I'm not really sure why Ottawa was a vacation destination, but um, yeah, that, that, that made the cut. Well, I did the same thing. Uh, my brother played in Cooperstown. We went up to Niagara and like just over the Canadian border and then back. But that was my first time to Canada, actually. That was a long time ago. Um, anyway, I get I, sorry. This is my bad. Sometimes I just distract people and, and we end up on tangents. Like, like yesterday I was on a coach's call with... Um, Coach McKenzie from UConn and I ended up we ended up having a conversation about one of the girls' motor scooters and the fact that its name is Patricia. And he's like, How did we get here? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, probably my fault though. Um, so back on the rails here. I did want to touch on a, like a little bit from that Toronto game because do we, you do you na- do you name your car? Like, are you a person who I'm names? I'm not okay. I know no, but I named my them my, my sister is. That's why I ask. And oh, it's okay. it seems like more of a more of a not to uh, you know make generalizations, but it seems like more of a girl thing than than a guy thing. That's funny. I, I actually don't know anyone that named their car in my family. So, um, but uh, yeah, the, no, I don't. What was I saying? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this one is your fault. I was I was saying that. We have recency bias, so we always end up talking about the most recent game. And this year, it kind of feels like it's always a loss recently. So um, in the second half, at least. uh, And there were some notes that I took from the Toronto game that, like, just worth bringing up quick. Like, good game. Another good game for Swayman. 
Um, he, he had a great game. Allmark had a good game too. So back back games where both the goalies played well. There was all the the speculation that Allmark got traded mid game because he wasn't on the bench for a little bit. Yeah, that was fun. That was that was pretty funny. Um, and I'm sure Allmark was like, "What the hell? Like, what? <laughs> what are we doing?" But um, it was funny. Like if you read, so Flutter Shinzawa was there and talked to him after and. If you read the story, like Allmark was completely oblivious until someone from Bruins PR told him like what was going on and people were freaking out on social media. And he said, you know, he found it funny and he was like, he's like, yeah, I guess people can speculate, but uh, yeah, but uh, you know, it, but it comes from a place of like everyone just kind of being on edge. And obviously Allmark's name has been out there. It's uh, another Pierre LeBron has been on this a couple times, but he tweeted again uh, Wednesday morning, just before we started recording, that Devils continue to look at Jacob Markstrom in Calgary, but are also interested in Linus Allmark if they can't get Markstrom. So I, I have no idea what the percentages are. Like it, it still seems like a long shot to me that he gets traded. And, you know, it also seems like a long shot to me that the Bruins get Elias Lindholm, but um like you could see how there's a connection there if you know if the Bruins have to move out salary to bring in Elias Lindholm who has a 4.85 million dollar cap hit they need assets to get Elias Lindholm well i don't know Lena Salmark makes 5 million dollars and presumably gets you one maybe two premium assets like you can see how those two deals could potentially be connected so no real inside info there, but like just connecting the dots. It's like um, all of a sudden you're convincing yourself there's going to be a four team trade going on. Like it's like bouncing everything around. It's like, oh, we can make this work. Um, I uh, just like for the storylines, like I want to see something huge. It feels like it could, it feels like it could be a kind of crazy. I don't, you know, I keep going back and forth on what I think this deadline is going to be like. Because yeah, there's, you, there's, you're times, not psychic. there's times where it seems like, well, everyone's so cap strapped and it's just going to be too hard for teams to make a lot of deals. Like last year was crazy. I think it was, um, I don't know if it was the TSN guy. I was, I was listening to something where they were talking about how many trades that there were leading up to last year's deadline. And it was like 12 this day, 10 the next day, 11 on deadline day. And obviously like some of those are much smaller ones. But it's like, yeah, that was a real flurry. And it still hasn't quite taken off. The Vegas gets Anthony Mantha. Like, that's a pretty big one. Um, but we're still waiting for, like, that that barrage of trades to come. And part of me does think it's still going to come. And, and I, you know, don't know when. It, Pittsburgh apparently wants to have a Gensel deal done by Wednesday night. So that feels like the biggest domino. So maybe that kind of sets things off. Yeah. We could be waiting for like last year there was flurries and this year there's just an avalanche. Like it just like comes all at once. Um, probably right after we record. Um, but, but that does transition us well into your opening shift, which was, which would be, um, basically the logistics of an Elias Lindholm trade. Um, the reporting that, and, and what you wrote about yesterday in your article about, cause yesterday everyone was just going about their business. And then all of a sudden Scott's writing like five articles uh, instead of the normal two, uh, because it's all this, all this news coming in. Yeah. Well, it, it was, it, it was good that I was like already at the garden when that Lindholm rumor came down, because otherwise I probably would have been driving in. Um, but yeah, I was there, I was there early yesterday because the Bruins opened um, their new Heritage Hall, which opens to the public on Wednesday. They had a grand opening on Tuesday um, with some media there. And really, really cool space, like a ton of great artifacts from all across the Bruins' 100-year history, literally going all the way back to, like, their very first game as as a franchise. Um, and then a couple of cool, like, exhibits for kids and stuff. There's – you can, like, shoot – there's um there's like a shooting thing you can uh 
you can call famous plays from Bruins history. Like you can sit behind uh, a desk. So Bridget, if you need, if you feel like you need any practice, play, just set me up. Yeah. In there. Uh, yeah. If you feel like you feel like you're a little rusty play by play wise at some point, you can go up there and you can practice some calls. Yeah. Um, like people are doing the, the Bobby Orr goal. They're doing the Bergeron, Bergeron, Bergeron against the Leafs. So um, <laughs> that seems like it could be fun for, especially for kids, but um but yeah, it was cool. So we were there for that. Caught up with Tuka Rask a little bit, but then we also got to talk to we got to talk to James Van Reams like before the game because it was his thousandth game. Then he had the Lindholm rumor. So yeah, just a, a whole bunch of stuff going on. But um, yeah, with with Lindholm though, it, it I will say there was I forget if this was also Chris Johnson or maybe Darren Drager reported that they don't think the Canucks are the favorite for Gensel, but they're definitely in on them and, and being pretty aggressive. And yeah, part, part of that aggressiveness could clearly potentially benefit the Bruins if they have to turn around and, and move Lindholm. And, um, you know, it Lindholm's having a little bit of a down year, especially offensively. Uh, he's only had six points in 14 games since he got to Vancouver. So that sort of all ties into my take, my belief that the price would be lower than what Vancouver paid for him a month ago. You're also getting him for a month less. So that should factor into it. Yeah. And, and what, what would be the cap situation? Well, because he, they're not going to retain his cap at all. They're not, because they're not able to, if they add Getzel. So like, yes. Yeah, so that's why his, so his cap hits 4.85 million. That's why, you know, if you're just doing the numbers, like Lena Solmark, 5 million, there's a pretty natural, uh, you know, fit there salary wise. Yeah. That'd be a big shakeup. That'd be a big time shakeup. And, uh, yeah. Now, now if that happens, I, I wonder what Razor will say this upcoming week. We really tried to push him on, like, just, just see if we could get him to budge a little bit about the goalie thing. He was not having it. Well, he, he did. He did eventually get to, you know, if it makes you a better team, he's open for it. Now, what exactly? Well, he also first snarked that if it gets you Connor McDavid, then of course you should do it. And I was like, that's right. not what we're talking about, Razor. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think you can make the case that if it's essentially all mark out Elias Lindholm in, and there's probably other pieces, and maybe the Bruins are giving up a you know, an extra piece or two or whatever. I certainly think you can make the case that that makes them a better team. Now it's gonna, it it will obviously depend on how Elias Lindholm fits. He wasn't, he, it hasn't yet been a, a natural fit in Vancouver. Um, you know, he wasn't putting up great numbers playing with, I'll say like lesser line mates than he's used to in Calgary. But to, to your point earlier, you put him on the line with David Pasternak, I think he's probably going to do pretty well, would, would be my did. guess. So, uh, you know, but that that does line up so naturally. Like, you know, let's, just for the sake of this exercise, say DeBrusque is staying, although he's obviously a name that could also surface if you're talking about a player moving out. But if he stayed or, or if you moved him and you brought in some other winger, like, the idea of sliding Zaka to the wing where I think he can probably get a little more involved offensively, um, you know, saying that he does have three goals in the last two games. So he has finally picked it up offensively here just this week. Yeah. Um, and he's coming but, off an injury. Like they keep alluding to like, he's not, maybe not a hundred percent right now. Yeah. But I mean, he got clear to play a day after yeah. the injury. So I'm not, I guess I'm not super worried about it, but yeah, uh, my thought is that it's been lingering and that that like him coming out of the game was just like a symptom of maybe something else that was going on. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I mean, there were a couple plays there where you could see where an injury happened, though. Like there was a little bit of like a knee on knee hit and then he crashed into the board. So I, who knows? Hard, hard to say. All we get is lower body and that. Yeah, could be anything, you know, so. yeah. But yeah, I, I like the idea of Zaka, Lindholm, Pasternak, keep Marshan, Coyle, DeBrusque. I like that third line of Van Riemsdyk, Geeky, Frederick, 
And then you put Heinen on your fourth line with, you know, say Bogvis and Brezzo or Lauko rotating in. I think Lauko's finally starting to play better and bring in the, the energy they need him to. So all of a sudden, like that looks like a that looks like a pretty strong lineup to me. Like that's yeah. that's something where I, I can see that and be like, okay, that can win in the playoffs. Like if you also have the defense and goaltending behind it, now now you're talking. Like now there's there aren't the obvious holes that it's felt like there have been at times this season. Yeah. And so then, then that kind of gets to what I was saying, which on Sunday, which was if, if it makes your team better to add a second line forward, you know, that's what Elias Lindholm is um, who can add to your offense and, and, you know, maybe get some of the other guys around him going uh, and not be a liability. Um, then if you're not going to use two goalies in the playoffs, is it such a huge deal that you like, that's the position where you do have some redundancy. And I, I wish they could find a way to keep both goalies and get Elias Lynn home, but then like they'd have to do some, you know, some other ca- cap has to go out. So, you know, what are you, are you moving two defensemen that like, are you moving Grizzly and forward out finding somewhere like to send those guys? You're probably going to have to, sweeten the deal for something like that. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's potential for them to do that. They did it last year with Craig Smith. Um, they were able to find a trade partner in Washington that was willing to take on the cat, like his cap and, and, and take him. And, um, yeah, they, they, they got Anaheim to take on John Moore's salary. Like, yeah, they've, they've done it before. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be like on active, like, like one of your better players, like with a bigger, like it could be something like that where it's like, okay, maybe we got to move out these two salaries of these guys that just did not pan out and we're not worth what we paid them. See if there's some move to be made. Like, will you take this person's salary and we'll give you like a whatever round pick? Um, I, I don't know. There's, there's all sorts of different ways to maneuver the cap that don't necessarily involve trading Allmark or DeBrusque. Which, by the way, to go on another tangent, um, I met Mr. DeBrusque yesterday. He was great. <laughs> I was, I wouldn't, I, he showed up the it, same time I did. Louis, Louis DeBrusque. Yes, Louis Jake's DeBrusque. Dad. He's a broadcaster. Yes, Jake's dad. Um, he, uh, he's a broadcaster for Sportsnet, right? And he, so he was there covering, covering the team for the Oilers. So he was at the away, the away TV. Um, he didn't know how to get to the ninth floor. So I helped him because there's only one elevator that goes there. He was going to get on the wrong one. I was like, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so I ended up talking to him and I was like, you got any more of those coupons to use today? Cause when he get, when he brought out that coupon for the last Oilers game of you have to get a goal and a sister, you have to do 20 push ups. It worked. And so I said, you got another one. And he said, not for today. I'm saving it for the playoffs. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see if he, he gets, you know, he pulls more of those out. Um, I was also a little bit concerned, not going to lie. If they traded the brusque off the team while his dad was in the building, that would have been real bad. And I yeah, was like, please be, don't do that. Please don't. That'd be rough. Or that like, would... cause Louis also came down to the locker room after the game. And I was like, yeah. you know, imagine if like something was like happening post game where, you know, Jake's catching up with dad. And then Don's like, Jake, can you come in here for a second? <laughs> yeah, I was really nervous for a second. I'm not going to lie. It was like, it had crossed no, they, they wouldn't do that though. Like they, people, People at least have like enough awareness and patience to usually avoid awkward situations, awkward situations like that. But um, yeah, on because you mentioned you know potentially turning things over to Swayman and riding him if they trade Allmark. We we also haven't touched on yet. Um, Elliot Friedman reported that Swayman and the Bruins are discussing an extension. There's been you could call them reports. I tend to call them more rumors that something's close um you know people have thrown out like long term eight years seven million a year uh i haven't seen any concrete reports on that i have heard that like there's movement that it's not just hey they're talking they've touched base i think they are they're moving together like i I think something's gonna happen at some point i just haven't been able to nail down whether it's like imminent but um yeah so it, it sounds like which i think we all expected there was going to be an extension at some point i don't know if i would have bet that it was going to be 
eight years, if that's what it ends up being, that is real long term, not just, you know, four or five years cashing again at, you know, when he's 30 years old type thing. Like that. Yeah, eight years seems real long for a goalie. Like I know it happens, but in terms of like year to year fluctuation and like injuries that can like, if you think there's, there's several injuries that can take a goalie out that would make their contract, like, you know, not, not worth what you originally paid for it. But I mean, I like Swayman. I think they should extend them. Eight years is a long time, but that's, I mean, good for Swayman if he can pull that off and, and um, he's set, he doesn't have to deal with arbitration again at that point, which he, he hated. So, um, so that'd be great for him. Uh, and then it'd be a real weird week if it was like, Swayman it's, extended, Allmark traded. Um, that'd by be- the way, if if it didn't, if it did end up being eight years, seven million a year, that is the same exact contract Tuga Rask signed in 2013. Um, and you know, I, I I can hear the Tuga haters now. I would say that wound up being worth it to me. Like yeah. you had, he was one of the best goalies in the league. That deal ran through 2021. He was one of the best goalies in the league pretty much the entire length of that contract. And seven million is not what top goalies get paid now. Like they the top top goalies are somewhere between eight and a half and ten, ten and a half. So you know, there is a there's a gamble on on the Bruins side there for it to be that long and for it to even be seven million, but if Swayman does continue to evolve into like a true number one goalie who can handle, you know, it's never going to, he's never going to get like 65, 70 starts, but can he handle 55? That seems pretty reasonable to me. Then 7 million probably ends up looking like a bargain in just a couple of years. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, okay, the prices by the time that you get to year five and six and seven and eight, you're like, okay, now the price for a goalie is way more than that. So it ends up evening back out at some point. You're like, okay, well, we have Swayman for this price, and and this this other goalie that's not as good just got an ex- extension that was way more. And, and you know, because that's just how, how money works. The market goes up and up, and so you tie a guy down long term. Like, same with Pasternak. That that deal sounds huge when, when he signs for over $11 million a year, but but towards the back half of that, it's not going to sound like that that crazy because it's going to be in comparison to guys who got extensions later and they the market was a different price at that time and and there was more money to go around and and so yeah that's what happens um with those kind of things do you have any final thoughts on by the way i've just been scrolling twitter like frantically um i'm very paranoid but do you have any? I'm, I'm, ch- I'm checking my alerts too, but it's, we, too. we haven't missed anything so far. I'm checking my email. I'm checking. I'm checking everything. Um, but <laughs> I know there are other things to talk about with Elias Lindholm, right? Like you had other other thoughts on him, or no? Did you get everything off off your chest that was relevant? Because I know you wrote a whole article about it. So, um, I, don't know. I feel like I got most of it off my chest. Um, just scroll my article to see if I missed anything, but no, I mean, look, I, you know, I know his 38 points in in 63 games, like doesn't jump out at people and his offense has gone down since he, as I mentioned, since he had the elite wingers of Gaudreau and, and Kachuk, um, you know, to me though, like all that signals is that you just have to know what you're getting in, in certain situations. Like if you put him with Pasternak, he's probably going to produce. If you put him with DeBrusque and Heinen or, you know, Van Riemsdyk and DeBrusque. Yeah. He, like he's probably not the kind of player who can lift those guys up and turn that into, you know, an elite second line. He, he, he needs some help that again, if he were, you know, if he were the player who had 40 goals, 80 points that year, if, if he were that consistently and he could do it with any winger, he would be looking at 10 plus million on his next contract. And I don't think he's going to get that. I think his extension is probably going to be more in like the, I'm just guessing, but I'm going to say like seven and a half to eight and a half, nine range. 
Like I'd be shocked if it gets to 10. And I would say if it, if you trade for him and that's what it ends up being for his extension market, like probably walk away. You probably, probably cut the loss there because that that's another part of it too. Right. Is if, if you are giving up premium assets to get Elias Lindholm, you probably want to sign to, to an extension or at least feel like you have a good chance to do that. So you got to have like an idea of what those ballpark numbers are, but you know, look, for, you got to be willing to spend on any good center. And right now, you know, the, the Bruins, all things considered, aren't spending a whole lot at the center position. So I think you have to be okay with, you know, whether it's eight, nine, whatever, even if it's a slight overpay, um, you know, there's no guarantee there's going to be any better option out there this summer, whether, whether that's free agency or, or a trade. So, you know, beggars can't be choosers. And when it comes to high end centers, like you are kind of a beggar. So, yeah. Well, and they were underpaying last year by so much at center because they're getting those team deals for Krejci and Bergeron that they kind of left themselves stuck having to fill, you know, what would normally be, you know, eight plus million dollar positions with, you know, what, what they already had. And then with Matt Patra, who unfortunately got hurt, but he will also be back next year. Let's not, well, as long as he doesn't get moved. Um, who, and I saw him yesterday. He was up on the ninth floor. He, he's so funny. He like, when he like moves, he's like, so like awkward. I don't know. He's funny. Um, he's just so like new that he, he's stuff still flusters him up there, I think. Um, but so my thought as well is that Lynn Holton could, we've been talking about who's the right center to put on the power play. And Lynn Holm could be a good option on either the first or the second power play unit. Um, winning the opening draw on the, on the power play is important. Um, and, you know, he, maybe he's an answer for how to get the, the power play a, a different look, make it, it just, just try it. Obviously that that's going to be tempting for them to put them out there on the power play. The yeah. First, first and I, I, I haven't, I don't know where Vancouver uses them. I do think Calgary used them in the bumper. So we've talked about how, you know, Bruins have been looking for an answer there all season. So definitely that could be another plus. Um, just like as we're getting ready to wrap up here, trade news, not well, I guess potential trade news not involved in the Bruins. Uh, Elliot Friedman just tweeted that um, Tarasenko. Pa- talks between Panthers and Senators involving Vladimir Tarasenko intensifying. So, um, you know, where I do think that can relate to the Bruins is uh, Florida was also one of the teams rumored to be in on Jake Gensel. So, you know, if they're going with Tarasenko instead, that would presumably take them out. So I don't know, maybe that, you know, bumps Vancouver up the list or narrows down the options. Um, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I'm just scrolling. That's the that's the only news I've seen since we started recording as well. So, you know what, Scott? We can wrap it up here, but I bet I'll see you again in about an hour. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. But right? We, we should tell people. So we're going to plan on doing a deadline reaction episode, um, you know, unsure of like exact timing of when that's going to be up, but we'll do something after the deadline. Pro- Don Sweeney usually meets with the media shortly after the deadline. So probably after that. And then, um, you know, hopefully sometime Friday evening night, there'll be something in, in your feed. Certainly I would say by Saturday morning at the latest, but um, we'll have that. And then of course we will be on Sunday skate Sunday morning with, with razor nine to 11 AM. And, yeah. We'll have a lot, lot more reaction to that, um, to the deadline, as well as you know, uh, upcoming games. Toronto again, Pittsburgh on Saturday. So, lots, lots, lots coming up. Yeah, and then we go to Montreal. Indeed. Um, and we'll probably record from there at some point. Uh, last year when I tried to, my Wi-Fi was shit though. So we'll see. If, we'll see how that goes. Um, but and uh, drop us a comment of good places to eat places to drink in Montreal because when we head up I already have ideas but I'm always open to new ones I you know I have my spots that I go but I like to try new stuff so if you got any Montreal suggestions let us know we won't be there super long 
Um, we do like breweries and craft beer. So just mm. keep that in mind. And poutine. Of course. Absolutely. I will not leave without poutine. So that's what I'm going to eat every meal. When I, I did a Quebec summer trip a couple years ago and like did Quebec City too. And I think in the span of three days, ate at three different poutine places in Quebec City and was actually all, like almost poutined out by the time I got to Montreal later that week. I think I think I still I think I still did did one poutine place in Montreal, but I was like, I should probably eat other stuff. Like this this can't be good. Poutined out. That just sounds like a weird sentence. That is just a weird phrase. I don't know if we can continue to use that, but yeah. No, I don't you your body is not happy with you, but your taste buds are. So, you know, you gotta you get away the it's it's you know, it's not quite beach season yet. We have time to have a little bit of French fries with gravy and cheese. Although I, I am going down to Florida later this month for the Bruce Oh, that's Carolina right. Too, so. Sorry, no poutine for you. Gotta get that beach bod ready. I'm, you know what? I'm prioritizing poutine. <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right. I think that's all we got for now. For now. We're going to make Brian record a breaking news podcast if anything happens in the next before we go to bed. So, all right. Scott? Talk Bridget. to you soon. Talk to you soon, probably. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Not not until maybe tomorrow. Okay. All right. We're going to say goodbye to everyone. We will have your updates on anything Bruins trade related. And we will talk to you then. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.